Wow, four years of scholarship, 25 years of passion. How can I compress that in 15 minutes? My full name is Albertus Hanukum, for those that can pronounce it. Formerly South African, came to Australia in 2009, working for National Geographic, catching animals, taking photos of fish underwater. And that is my study topic. I first would like to thank my sponsors, the Fisheries Research and Development Corporation for their trust in my study topic, their trust in me and their financial support for my scholarship. 2019 was my second attempt for a Nuffield scholarship and I got it. Uh, Nuffield Australia, Jody and an amazing team, thank you for your unwavering support over the last four years for our scholarship to keep it alive over four years until we were able to travel. It's, I actually woke up this morning with that song in my head. If I could turn back time, I'd definitely do it again. Um, my wife, Lisa, for her support, she knows when to stoke the fires, she knows when to put fires out when I develop crazy ideas, and she's yet again manning the fort at home while I'm traveling the world chasing my passion. Global Focus Program host, uh, Bernadette, one of them are here, yeah. Thank you for your support, making our Global Focal Program so amazing. And fellow 2020 and 2021 scholars, the first years of our scholarship, we stayed in contact remotely, Zoom meetings, text messages, WhatsApp. Thank you for having my back during this time by saying, keep going, Barry. Baramandi production in Australia, 2019-2020, um, was just over 10,000 tonnes. A couple of years later, that was when I got my scholarship. A few years later, last financial year, it jumped up with almost 5,000 tonnes. Now, how did the Baramandi industry do that? These figures are from the Baramandi Farmers Association. It is definitely not the total production in Australia. Some producers are not members and they don't always reveal exactly where much they produce. Um, global production is about 130,000 tonnes, so Australia is definitely not the largest role player in this industry. Aussies love Barra. We consume 25,000 tonnes per year locally. And unfortunately, 68% of that was imported around 2008, 2009. And from 2020 onwards, still upwards of 50% is imported. There's a lot of scope for barramundi farmers to produce more so we can fill that gap. My journey in aquaculture started in 1991, just north of Cape Town, around a barbecue with the trout. And I commented on how nice this trout was and where did the guy catch it? He goes, no, mate, we farm them. I goes, really? You farm fish? He said, yeah, introduced me to a guy the next day I started a job at a fish farm, Devon Trout Farms. Now that farm didn't last long and neither did my employment because of unreliable fingerling supply. No seed stock means no harvest. Years later, when I came to Australia, I got the opportunity at Cone Bay as nursery manager and I immediately jumped at that. Quarter past seven that morning, I got a phone call mate, can you be in Derby this afternoon? It's nearly a thousand k's away. I ran home. I said to my wife, I'm going to Cone Bay. Now? I said, yes. So I left. <laughs> while, I <was> at, <laughs> while I was at Cone Bay, the farm started to grow and produce more barra. So the nursery came under more pressure to produce more fingerlings for the grow out on the farm. And it soon became apparent to grow more fish I need to better manage the stock levels. And how do I do that? I started reading articles and I came across an article on an advanced nursery system. And I thought, well, if this benefit other aquaculture industries, how can it benefit the barramundi industries? And for the second time, I applied for a scholarship. I called Dan up. He was the opposition farmer back then. And he said, Bertie, go for it. And thanks, Dan. So when you look at the picture there, you can see at the fish farm, I clearly had a great following. 
The objectives of my study travel is to identify and overcome site-specific challenges. One of the biggest challenges at Cone Bay was temperature variations. Um, how do we do that? Commercialize the nursery as the reserve bank of the industry. Make sure that that nursery can consistently supply the industry. Introduce the advanced nursery phase into barramundi culture that was not previously done at that time. Um, what benefits has other aquaculture industries had from utilizing and implementing that advanced nursery system? And what benefits can that bring back to Australia into the barramundi farming industry? My take homes during my study travels, you can see me clearly there in my happy place. The Atlantic salmon industry in Tasmania invested $50 million US into a new advanced nursery system, and they reaped the benefits from that. Further during my travels, I wanted to see how the Israelis, they can do anything everywhere in the world. How did they benefit? And how did their aquaculture industry benefit from their nursery systems? I spent some time on St. John's Island in Singapore, and Singapore quite broadly advocate that they want to produce 30% of their own seafood in 2030. And at the Tropical Institute of Fish Research, I spent a few weeks there and learned some amazing things. Then our own Humpty Doo Barramundi farm, they currently produce 50% of Australian barramundi in the last financial year. And that is due to a massive expansion that they've had. And I believe the nurseries has played a great role in that. The Japanese aquaculture industry is synonymous with high price and high quality. Think about sushi. Treat yourself, go have sushi. High price, high quality. And how did the Japanese use advanced nursery systems to add value to their products? Our own mainstream aquaculture in Victoria, they are the largest supplier of barramundi fingerlings in Australia, and they've also recently invested in farms in Queensland. The role of the nursery system in aquaculture is to facilitate the growth and development of post-larval fish. So baby fish from one gram to 250 gram. That's the larval stage to the juvenile stage. Nurseries and hatcheries can be viewed as the reserve banks of the industry. And some nursery and hatchery systems are combined with their own in-house brood stock. By doing that, they are less reliable on other entities, so it makes them more secure. They also do on-demand production. Modern hatcheries can hatch fish all year round. Historically, you can hatch trout end of the winter, starting of the summer. The same with barramundi, October, November, December, and that was it. Now they can hatch all year round. They supply the nursery, the nursery supply that grow out all year round. If they want fish, they order it, they get it. Barramundi production system, that's a beautiful picture you see in the Buccaneer Archipelago, Cone Bay Ocean Barramundi. It's also the most remote fish farm in Australia, 65 nautical miles north of Derby. So logistically, it's a challenge to farm there. That photo is courtesy of Stephen Davies, 2016 Nuffield Scholar, and he's the guy that introduced me to Nuffield. They produce about 3,000 ton of ocean barramundi. The biggest challenge at Cone Bay was temperature variations. And if you see between the two parallel lines, or sorry, the vertical lines on that graph, over three years, the water temperatures were recorded. That's the ocean water temperatures. It's not like a pond where you can put a heater in and warm it up. Good luck. For those four months of the year, you could simply not stock baby barra into the ocean environment. There was such poor performance and batch after batch had to be either discarded, cold, or it just was not economically viable. Now I'm gonna use the laser pointer the right-hand image there, that's the 100-ton flow-through nursery. It's a very basic system, and we still manage to put one and a half million fingerlings through that nursery a year. That is from one gram to 50 gram in eight weeks. They do grow relatively quick. The image on the left is the Singapore's farm. 
that is their advanced nursery system back in the years when Singapore and Kanbei were still merged as the same, under the same company. They had three nurseries. One would grow from one gram to 20 grams, then they go 20 to 50, and then 50 to 350 grams before they would be released into the ocean environment. Werribee, that is Victoria. Now, who would believe you can grow barra in a shed in Victoria? It's cold there. Mainstream aquaculture is lucky. They sit on an artesian ball all year round 28 degrees Celsius, which is optimum growing temperatures for barramundi. And that shed is just over one hectare, and they produce a 1,000 tons a year. So fish rock where it comes to production. <laughs> um, they also one hour away from a major market outlet, Melbourne. Now, these hyper-intensive aquaculture systems, their consistency of supply and higher production volumes make that investment viable. They produce resilient and healthy stock with a higher survival rate because they grow them bigger in that system before they get exposed to other environments. Uniformity of stock with a low variation in size, a higher price for those that are interested in live fish markets, and the largest stock and open ponds are less susceptible to predation and cannibalism. One of the biggest challenges in barramundi culture in the juvenile state, they're all boys. They love each other. <laughs> Grading and handling them every four days to make sure uniformity of size is key because if one of them looks bigger or smaller, he does get picked on. Then by keeping the fish la longer in these systems is a shorter turnaround time in the production system. The farmer needs to make sure or decide where is his biggest risk. A sea cage out in the elements and the tropical areas susceptible to cyclones or in an environment where they can control and man manipulate the parameters for water qualities and also on-demand production. Now, with the on-demand production, if the grow out say, I want five million fingerlings, yes, they get five million fingerlings. You look back and you go, mm, Bertie, you forgot about that pond. There's still another 100,000 left. Grow them out to 250 to 350 grams, put them onto the market as table fish. They generally get a good price, and six months after input, you get a return on your capital instead of two years that you have to wait to grow a barrel from one gram to three and a half kilos, about the size of the one that Dan always poses with, with pictures. <laughs> My greatest learning from the Global Focus Program in Japan is a high value flounder nursery. Now flounder are very finicky, very fragile fish. And to commercially grow them, you have to do things right. This nursery produces three and a half million fingerlings for grow out facilities in the immediate region. A portion of their stock are kept back for their own business, high value restaurants and live fish markets. The nursery's reliable supply guarantee consistent size. One thing I've learned in Japan, they concentrate and value food. Food is a gift. If I get given a gift that looks beautiful, people will add more value to it. They will appreciate that gift more. So their fish must be uniform and they must look good. And the nurseries facilitate them and help them to make their product look amazing. Most of the fish are sold into live markets. Uh, some of the top end restaurants in Japan, you go and you go, I'd like that fishing. And the chef will prepare that for you immacu immaculately. Israel, my best learnings in Israel was they started Ardak Marine on that premises in 1980. 1980s, about the same time where aquaculture became popular in Australia, barramundi farming in the north, salmon farming down south in Tasmania. Now, these guys are ideally located on the Red Sea coast. They can distribute their product between the Mediterranean and the Red Sea with relatively ease. They produce five million fingerlings of sea bass and sea bream from their own in-house broodstock. Now, having their own nursery and be able to monitor their stock for up to six months 
they can identify key performing animals, isolate them, tag them, and see if those animals perform well throughout their entire life, and they will become future potential broodstock. Most fingerlings exit that nursery between 25 and 50 grams. They don't have to grow them 250 or 300 grams because they get transported in tanker trucks or well boats. Now, they export fry, that's newly hatched fish, one gram to 24 international countries. They're close to Europe. They can export to Europe anywhere on the Mediterranean Sea, even to the U.S., now, a second part of that farm is the V corals, the nutrient-rich waters from the fish. A lot of phosphate, a lot of ammonia that fish farmers always try to get rid of benefits the growth of the corals. They grow endangered and endemic coral species, which are sold into the in international aquarium industry market and also made available for conservation and reef restoration projects. That beautiful shed there is the Whale Point Nursery in Tasmania in the Huon Valley. That has the investment of 55 million US dollars. Their biggest success out of that shed is a shorter turnaround time and high production volumes. Tasmania's very strict environmental policy does not allow for additional and more aquaculture leases offshore. If you want to produce more, you need to find a way to turn your stock around quicker. That, that shed can hold or produce 800 tons of smolts per year. Historically, they used to take the smolts up to 50 grams, that's about that big, put them out in the ocean and hope for the best. Now they grow them up to 600 gram and then put them out in the ocean. That reduced the time to harvest with four months. So if you take that four months off the production cycle, you can put a lot, of, lot more fish through that system. And they didn't want to reveal a lot of their true figures, but per ocean lease, they get about 17,000 ton additional in production by reducing that turnaround with four months. The ocean leases can hold 25% more stock now that facility is zero discharge. All the water in there is used, filtered, and recycled. The waste solids are separated and sold as organic fertilizer. The remaining water is sterilized, clean, filtered, and they use that as transport water in the well boats. The biosecurity in a facility like that is fairly easy to manage. All incoming water are sterilized, screened, so to get pathogens into that system is very unlikely. And whatever stock leaves that system can be certified as pathogen-free stock. The location and transfer to sea, on that end of the nursery, there's a pipeline that goes down. It's about a thousand meter long pipeline, 300 mil diameter. They connect that to the tank and they pump the fish in the water straight into the well boat. Historically, they had to take those fish, put them in a tanker truck, drive them to the other side of Tasmania four, five, six hours later. Tasmania hasn't got the distance, but they don't have straight roads. Um, now that's no more necessary. From the nursery, straight into the well boat, straight into the ocean leases. Um, the significant savings on bathing is reduced by 40%, and the survival rate from transfer to sea, they had 0.05% losses never before achieved. They historically had more losses. Then another form of a recirculating aquaculture system is the Humpty Doo Barramundi, where they utilize wetlands to clean their salt water before it goes back to the nursery. They don't invest or have to invest in a very expensive filtration system. Mother Nature does that for them. The capacity of that system is 5 million fingerlings at 200 grams. And the total production of that farm last financial year is five and a half thousand ton into the, the Australian Barramundi market. Another recirculating aquaculture system is Mariville Farm, that is in North Queensland from 2012, Scotland, 2012, right date, Mari Phillips. 
that facility produces a million fingerlings per year of 200 grams. And interesting with that, historically, he could only utilize his nursery for eight months of the year. Now he can utilize that for 12 months of the year. If the farmer's gonna invest a couple of million dollars into a big shed and a big system, you would like to use that consistently. So there's no peaks and troughs in production. It is go, go, go all the time. Before they had the advanced nursery system and they grew their fish longer on land in nurseries, the fingerlings were stocked in little drop-in cages. Now those drop-in cages goes into the, the ponds. It's labor intensive, it's expensive to maintain. And also, if a croc gets in there, he has a royal time and the farmer doesn't. Fish get, uh, I mean, larger birds get in there and they can completely do away with that. At Cone Bay, these drop-in cages had to be towed around with a boat moored in a secure location. They also have saltwater crocodiles, sharks, birds, larger ocean fish, and they can completely do away with that by stocking larger fish into the systems. The conclusions. The advanced nursery system add value to aquaculture through the efficiency of production. You can't accelerate the growth rate of that species with the advanced nursery system. Fish grow their normal growth rate. So it is not a magic bullet. It is a good facilitating tool. The actual production phase of the fish can be shortened in the production system. The greatest risk is with your fish sitting out in the ocean in a cage, 50 k's from land or nautical miles from land where you can't control the environment. That what you can control is in the nursery. And that now, and these two examples, the Atlantic salmon industry with stocking larger smolts has reduced the time at sea from input to harvest with four months. And Marty Phillips on his farm with his nursery system is saving three months. So he can produce more fish on his farm. He can't expand the size of his farm, but he can produce more in that same area. That concludes that um, I tried to compress 20 years of passion and four years of scholarship in 15 minutes. For those that's got questions and want to know more, my report will be available soon and I'll sit here quietly and wait for questions. Thank you. Thank you.